Hey everybody, before we get started, just to let you know, you can download a high resolution version of the canvas that we're gonna introduce. I've put a link in the description, or you can simply go to this URL. Let's jump into it. The press tends to focus on the latest academic findings of AI. And at Growth Cry, we like to focus on the low hanging fruit, the practical and more tangible uses of AI for marketing and growth. The stuff you can start applying tomorrow. If you haven't already done so, please check out the earlier videos where we actually address these easy, low hanging fruit applications of AI for marketing and growth. Over the course of the last year, through the trainings that we've delivered and through the use cases we've worked on, we've developed an AI canvas, which will allow you to determine whether you should apply AI for a business this case at all and ensure a good scoping and preparation of an AI project. Although other canvases exist, we believe this one best meets the needs of analytics translators, domain experts, marketeers, heads of growth, and data scientists alike. So here's a quick overview. The canvas is separated into five columns, which should be covered from left to right. First, the business side of things, then the data, then the actual testing phase right in the middle. Next is the evaluation phase to see if this is actually working. And finally, the action phase when you have a model that's worth implementing. We've also added a practical little indication of which sections are the most difficult and or the most important with this little yellow dot. You'll probably need to look out for these sections as they're more critical and they typically require more time. First of all, the business. And funnily enough, this is actually a very often overlooked part of an AI project. We've often said that data science shouldn't be left to data scientists alone. It should also be in the hands of domain experts or heads of departments who understand the business implications of running an AI project. Check out this video where we talk about a new role called the analytics trans Translator, which is a mix of domain knowledge, AI intuitive understanding, project management, and enterprising spirit. The first section, what is our goal, as you'll see, has an importance dot. Here you should answer what question do we want the AI to answer? Are you an online platform that wants to anticipate which customer will be worth the most and which will leave the platform? Are you a B2B company that wants to score leads? Are you an energy company that wants to cluster customers? Or are you a new startup that wants to automatically translate customer feedback or improve the product? And more importantly, do we even need AI to help answer this business question. Sometimes descriptive analytics, business intelligence, a simple Excel file, or even simply talking to customers is enough to get the job done. Sometimes the project stops right here in this box because we realize we don't need AI to solve this business problem. Sometimes bringing in AI is like bringing in a bazooka to kill a fly. Of course, don't kill flies. For a great list of questions that we believe AI can help answering, go ahead and check our navigation cheat sheet on this URL. The next section is project priority. And this is an absolute showstopper. One of the top three reasons why we've seen AI projects not come to fruition is simply because they were addressing an issue that wasn't a priority for the organization. AI projects involve time, commitment, and multiple stakeholders. If you work on something that's not a high priority or high on the roadmap, you might not get the internal buy-in and the stakeholder support to make the project successful. Make sure you work on something that matters, something that you can showcase internally. Which leads us to our next section about possible blockers. What possible hurdles or blockers should we expect and begin to alleviate? Access to data, access to automation tools, privacy issues, lack of resources, poor team commitment, pushback from other departments. List anything that could block your project. Which then leads us to stakeholders. Which internal people and stakeholders should we involve early on to remove possible blockers and to get support? Some usual suspects are CTOs, chief chief data officers, product owners, executives, but also sales, marketing, UX, or CRM teams. Now that we've validated that this is a valid project to work on, and now that we think we can get company buy-in, it's time to move to the oil of the project, the electricity of the project, the actual data. We begin with the most essential part of this column. In some regards, this is a throwback to the what is our goal box, but it's a bit more precise. What specific outcome are we looking for? In the case of prediction models, what metric are we trying to predict? In the case of clustering, what patterns are we looking for? In the case of natural language processing, what are we looking for in the text? Sentiment? Topics? In the case of image detection, what are we trying to uncover from a tensor of images? Now, based on this outcome that we want to achieve, what data or data sources do we need in order to achieve this outcome? In this section, I'd suggest not limiting yourselves to what you think is available. Really focus on the data that you would want in the ideal scenario. Sit down with your team and start listing them on a whiteboard and try to be as creative and even as unrealistic as you want. Now, this next section is going to be the 
data reality check. And as you can see, this one has an important thought. It's critical and difficult. Based on the data that we want, what do we actually have at the moment? And how is the data actually structured? This is the part where you need to involve other people who manage the data within the organization. And typically, the larger the organization, the more people are involved. Critical question here, do we already have all of the data or do we need to start acquiring it? Do we need to start gathering it? And by the way, in this section, you'll usually realize that you forgot a few key stakeholders in the stakeholders box. Some of them will start coming to mind. Before we move to the next column, just a quick reminder, you can download this canvas at this URL. Cool. Now let's move on to the actual testing phase. In this section, you'll need to use your AI knowledge to navigate the testing phase of the project. Without the right understanding of AI as a tool, this might be a trickier part of the canvas. But that's also why we give training in AI for non-data scientists. So we're going to kick off with how are we going to measure the success of our AI project? What metric will we use to define the success criteria of the AI project? Here we will use conventional measures of success depending on the type of AI project. Let's give some examples. For supervised learning projects like classification models, we would use recall, precision, or accuracy. For value regressions, we would use R2 scores. For clustering cases, we'd use the silhouette. For natural language processing, we've used the LDA, and so forth. Now these are some of the things we teach in our courses, and these are learnings that are acquired through a little bit more than a 10 or a 15 minute YouTube video. Next up is pretty specific about what tools and what algorithms we're going to use to try to answer the question of the project. What algorithms are we going to use to reach our outcome variable based on the data that we have? It can sometimes be hard to navigate the wide and complex range of algorithms that can be used in AI projects, which is why we created the AI cheat sheet, which I mentioned before. The next one is really interesting. What is the current human performance human performance on this task. Thanks to this, we'll later be able to measure the money, time, and performance impact of actually using a model. Should we even use a model? Some examples. In the absence of machine learning models, we are creating personas and clusters simply by hand. Another example. In the absence of a model, we are treating all customers the same, regardless of whether or not they're likely to churn. In the absence of a model, we are analyzing tons of customer feedback by hand rather than using topic modeling. These are just some examples. Here, you really want to set the current human benchmark. And now to the final section of the actual testing phase. Do we need to start from scratch or can we use machine learning as a service, an off-the-shelf solution that's already been prepared? Many image recognition algorithms have already been pre-trained. Would you want to start from scratch? Same thing for nudity detection models or profanity detection models. But in the majority of cases, your use case will be specific to your business and we will need to start from the beginning. Great. Now on to the next section. After we've tested the model, it's time to assess its performance. Are we happy with the results? For prediction models? Are there too many false positives? Are we happy with the ROCAUC? For a clustering exercise, a segmentation exercise, are we happy with the number of clusters? Are we happy with the score of the silhouette? So basically put, are we happy with the output of the model or do we need to optimize and or retest it? This next section, byproducts, is actually really interesting. When running machine learning models, some types of models are what we call interpretable models. You can interpret them. This means that you can actually dive under the hood and go into the brain of the model to see how the model took its decision, how it came up with the outcome. This is the case with regressions or with forest, for example. But it's not the case with neural networks, which we call black boxes. Although some people are working on this at the moment, trying to make black box neural networks interpretable. So one great byproduct of interpretable algorithms is that they give us extra information, sort of a nice to have. So for example, in the case of a predictive model, we might be able to see which features, which factors, which variables are linked to the outcome. In an unsupervised model, in a segmentation model, for example, we could see which features and factors are the key drivers of differentiation between the different clusters. Okay, now let's move on to the next part called interventions to test. And this is where your brain starts to be important again. Based on the outcome of the algorithm, which experiments do we want to start testing? AI models are not like A-B tests. They don't prove causality. You still need to test whether when live, the automation will have a positive effect. So in this section, you'll need to come up with ideas for new features, new offers, new campaigns, new nudges new copy, new marketing or product or sales efforts that you want to run based on the outcome of the model. And then it's up to you to create the experiment so that you can reliably tell whether it had a positive, a neutral or a negative effect on the metric that you're trying to improve. And in the next section, we would put the results or the findings from that experiment. Did we get an uplift in conversions? Were we able to drive more traffic? Were we able to increase
increase net promoter score? Were we able to increase retention, increase engagement? Was the experiment effective? Now let's move on to the fifth column, the last part of the canvas. Now we're in the action part, the part where we take action. In the first section, it's about automation. So if we're happy with the model, do we actually want to automate? This can be, for example, automating lead scores with a direct message to the sales team, automatically putting customers into clusters once they hit the website and do enough actions, automating a recommendation engine, automating your topic modeling algorithm to understand what topic a customer on a chat is talking about. This is the part where all your hard work and research can finally be duplicated and systemized and automated. So you've run your experiment, you've done your AI test, and the results are interesting or even amazing. But how to communicate this to other people within the organization? You need to start asking yourself that question. This is where you gain love and traction and internal evangelization of this AI way of working. Do you need pivot tables showing the churn rate per account type and user type? The list of primary features related to churn. If you've created new customer clusters, give them meaningful names that everyone will understand and describe those personas based on the most important features. To ease visualization for key stakeholders, use graphs and charts that they can easily understand. And then the last section, which also has a dot, is about driving adoption. People shouldn't be dependent on you to be able to keep running and optimizing this model. How do you drive more AI adoption within the organization? And although this is a continual non-stop process, we have included it in the canvas. How do you make sure you're not the only one who can run this model? At least another person, data scientist, or somebody within the specific department should be able to also train and test and run this model. So the basic question is, how are we going to bring other people on board to be able to understand this and run it themselves? So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this journey through the AI canvas. As always, please support us by commenting and subscribing, and we'll see you really, really soon.